Well, I think we're ready to kind of build up to that 1917 merger. Uh, but first, I, I just want to, was there any, understand, was there any like distinctive, maybe different uh, theological stances that the, the Haugian Synod had, or was it just more of the, the emphasis of, of your, the spiritual life? You know, that's a really interesting question. And it's, it's hard to get at um, without actually looking at the way theology was lived out on the ground. Uh, one actually, uh, th there was a a study that I ran across where uh, they compared the sermons of a, a Haugi Synod pastor with uh, a pastor from the Norwegian Synod. Uh, now, usually we think of these two groups as being polar opposites, mm -hmm. but what they discovered is actually there wasn't much of a difference in what was being preached. Um, in both cases, the Haugi Synod pastor, the Norwegian Synod pastor, were preaching about the importance of like personal conversion, you know, uh, hearing the word of God and having it impact your life and all of that. So very similar. And in a lot of cases, actually, the we tend to sensationalize these you know things. We we tend to emphasize like the contentious issues among the leadership. Mm -hmm. But on a local level, it seems that actually these various pastors had a lot in common with each other and they would often be friends with each other. So if you were a Norwegian pastor from Haugi's Synod and you lived in a community where there was a Norwegian Synod congregation and, you know, these pastors would often be friends with each other because who else are they going to talk to, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, so they, um, they often had a lot more in common than we want to admit. Uh, having said that, you know, one theological issue that eventually arises that Haugi Synod plays a role in, but not really the primary role, uh, was this dispute about how to talk about the nature of election mm -hmm. or predestination. And that's going to come to be a big issue in the Norwegian uh, uh, American Lutheran uh, experience. And so I think that's kind of a lead into your next uh, question there. Yeah, and just to reference, I don't know if you've had a chance to, to listen to it, but we've had a, a John Brenner on with his election controversy book, and we've also uh, had a, a two-part episode on uh, the formation of the Evangelical Lutheran Synod. So kind of taking it from that perspective, uh, yeah, uh, listeners to this podcast, they've heard election controversy pop up several times. So uh, maybe for the sake of our time, uh, I'll just refer people to, to those episodes. It's episode number four uh, for the election controversy. Um, so that, that's a theological issue. And, and so where would the Haugians stand in that controversy? I would assume they probably aren't with Walther, but they weren't really the main uh, players in this controversy either, were they? No, no, not really at all, actually. And that's interesting because a lot of times the Haugians are sometimes labeled as sort of the um, kind of the villains in that mm -hmm. in that uh, controversy. Actually, the, the controversy as it led up to that merger of 1917 uh, was more of a dispute between the Norwegian Synod folks and the people that were a part of what was called the United Norwegian Lutheran Church. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the those were the main players. Uh, Haugi's Synod, uh, they tended to probably come down more on the side of the United Norwegians mm -hmm. uh, in the way that they talked about the significance of election. And I don't know if this has been discussed before, but one of the difficult things about this is that the Norwegian American Lutheran tradition never fully acknowledged the authority of the entire Book of Concord as its uh, confessional basis. And that's for historical reasons. Um, back, when, uh, back when the formula of Concord was written uh, and published in 1580, mm -hmm. uh, there was some movement to try to get the, the King of Denmark to acknowledge the formula of Concord. Well, the King of Denmark didn't wanna do that because he didn't think it was necessary. And he felt that if he accepted a broader confessional statement that was more specifically condemning Calvinists and so forth, that could potentially alienate allies, like from England. In a political the sense, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he just didn't think it was necessary. So he actually had copies of the formula of Concord burned. Mm -hmm. um, so the Dano-Norwegian tradition did not 
recognize the entire formula of Concord. For them, their confessional basis officially was uh, the Augsburg Confession and Luther's small catechism. And as I said, in Norway, this document called um, Pontopidon's Catechism, Truth mm -hmm. Unto Godliness, came pretty close to being considered a confessional document. Okay. Now, one of the things uh, about this is one of the questions in Pontopidon's Catechism had to do with how to talk about what it means to be elected by God. And the way that that question words it, it talks about election in view of faith, the uh, what would often be called the second form of election. So this was circulating around the Norwegian environment, and that's the way that it was generally talked about. Um, so, you know, Lutherans in the, from Norway and the Norwegians in America didn't really, they weren't on the same playing field as maybe other Lutherans were. Uh, some of the folks in the Norwegian Synod wanted to formally adopt the formula of Concord, but it never actually happened. Uh, so th this was a, a piece of the, the struggle as well. Um, they just were not used to that as a part of their tradition. Yeah, interesting. I, I forgot uh, the article, but there was a recent article that kind of addressed that issue specifically head on. I don't know if it was in the Lutheran Historical Conference Journal or, or something else, but yeah, that's another, that's a whole nother topic of just that confessionalism uh, for sure. Um, so kind of from a Haugian Synod perspective, how was that 1917, that famous merger possible? Like what, what brought them from not in fellowship or at least not merged to being, to being merged? Well, it was the struggle. Um, Interestingly, um, you know, prior to the 1917 merger, there was another merger uh, in 1890. And uh, the 1890 merger involved the group uh, that had left the Norwegian Synod. A large group left the Norwegian Synod in 1887 over this issue, largely, of election. Uh, these people from the Norwegian Synod that left, they were uncomfortable with what was called the first form of election, that God elects unto faith. And they left, about a third of the Norwegian Synod left in 1887. Mm -hmm. They formed a group called the Anti-Missourian Brotherhood. And they, um, they were a temporary organization. And they kind of set up shop uh, out of St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota, they wanted to work toward greater union among Norwegian Lutherans. And so they involved. Uh, <laughs> That's just kind of ironic. You know, you're the anti uh, something, but let's be more. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. Right. It's, it's kind of interesting, but they, yeah. they didn't want to perpetuate further division. They wanted mm -hmm. to work toward more union. So they involved a couple of other groups. They, they got uh, the group called the conference for the Norwegian Danish Lutheran church in America called the conference usually. That was a pretty large group. And then there was that smaller group that I talked about earlier, the Norwegian Augustana Synod. Those two groups had historically been together, but when they split from the Swedish, the Swedish contingent, uh, they split into two groups themselves, which is another story for another time. But um, so the anti Missourians got together with them. They involved Haugi's Synod in the discussion about a possible merger leading up to 1890. Uh, but Haugi's Synod actually withdrew from that at the last minute. Mm. And they felt that they were worried about losing their distinctive identity. But really interestingly, it was Haugi's Synod in 1905 that initiated the merger discussions mm. that would result in the 1917 merger. They were the ones that sent out representatives, they sent out invitations to the Norwegian Synod, the United Norwegians, to talk about a possible union. So they did, um, they agreed. And over the course of the years, they had a number of meetings, free conferences at first. Uh, they would not in involve prayer mm -hmm. because uh, that would be a sign of union. Mm -hmm. But eventually they started to involve prayer. And Interesting. Haugi Synod, you know, the, the debate among the, uh, the debate among the Norwegian Synod, of course, had to do with uh, any reservations that the Norwegian Synod had, had largely to do with theology. You know, the compromise involving 
how to talk about election or predestination. And eventually in 1912, they hammered out some arrangements saying that it's okay to hold either one of those, um, those, those viewpoints about this. But Hauge's Synod, they had a very different uh, set of concerns. Uh, their concern was getting swallowed up into a large organization with, that would be called the Norwegian Lutheran Church of America of 1917. Will they allow for our distinctive traditions to exist, uh, to continue to have influence on the organization? And many of the Haugians believed that by merging, their traditions would go on to influence the others, which of course is a pipe dream. You know, right. it didn't really happen. Uh, but leading up to the merger of 1917, they drafted what they called an interpretation. And they said, okay, we agree with this. We agree that we can merge. But when it comes to the issue of what's called unionism, um, the, uh, the constitution that was drafted for the, uh, this new organization in 1917, it said that unionism with non-Lutheran church groups was not to be practiced. Mm -hmm. So what they call reformed, uh, meaning a uh, broad designation for basically any non-Lutheran Christian church at the time, Methodist, Baptist, whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, the, 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 Haugis, the Haugians, one thing I didn't really mention before is that the Haugians had as a part of their legacy, uh, they valued their Lutheran identity, mm -hmm. but they also walked the difficult line of recognizing the presence of authentic faith in non-Lutheran groups as well. Mm -hmm. So generally, Haugi Synod was a little more ecumenical in their approach. They, they were not so rigid about who they could pray with. Uh, as long as people demonstrated a, a genuine faith in Christ, uh, they were okay with praying with them and engaging in certain activities with them. So in this interpretation, they said, unionism does not refer to participating in funerals, weddings, um, other such things, you know, occasional community celebrations and things that involve, you know, clergy from other Christian traditions. Uh, so that they wanted to safeguard their ability to practice those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, and they also said that we consider that our tradition of worship uh, which involves more free prayer, non-liturgical type worship. This has recognition. Um, also, they were concerned about having to wear vestments. Uh, the clergy of Haugi Synod didn't want to have to do that. Um, so this interpretation laid out sort of their concerns, and it was accepted by the others, but the people from the Norwegian Synod said, okay, we recognize this, but we also reserve the right to witness against what you're doing. And mm -hmm. so even though they're unified on paper, <laughs> you can see that this isn't going to always go well into the future. Yeah. Kind of like, we'll, we'll, we'll say it, it, we're unified, but in reality, nothing's changed and we're not unified. Okay. Interesting. So were there any uh, Haugian uh concerns, protests, holdouts, or maybe even splinter groups uh, about this merger? Like, do they all go along willingly or, or were there some resistance? Well, there was some resistance, but what ended up happening is there was actually no formal splinter group that was formed okay. out of it. But there might've been a couple of congregations that actually declined to join the, the new organization. I'm thinking of one in particular in uh, central Minnesota, Actually, a friend of mine is serving as the pastor of that right now. Hmm. Uh, so that's a part of their history. So it's interesting to hear from him about the way they do things. Uh, one thing that he notes, actually, is that a part of their tradition is that they don't engage in any public absolution of hmm. sin. They have public confession of sin, but the pastor does not pronounce absolution uh, because they believe that Absolution is something you should receive privately after a private confession. And that's still uh, happening in, in 2021 is what you're saying. 
Yeah. Interesting. Yep. Okay. And, you know, their concern there is that, you know, is that public confession of sin and public absolution would grant people false assurance of salvation. Uh, so that was a part of their, their, their tradition too. But uh, there was no single group that held out of that merger. They all went along with it. Okay. Uh, one of the leading figures, um, one of the leading figures of uh, Hauge's Synod was a guy named Gustav Marius Bruce. Uh, he was a professor at Red Wing Seminary. And he was probably the most well-known, prominent figure in, in Hauge's Synod leading up to that. And uh, I, I uncovered some correspondence between him and this lay uh, person from North Dakota. And of course, this was written in Norwegian. Uh, so I had to, to decipher it. But uh, it's interesting that this guy from North Dakota wrote to Gustav Marius Bruce. And he said that, you know, the Bible says that God's children should not be unified with the devil's children. And uh, so therefore, I don't think this merger is is acceptable. Wow. And Bruce said, you know, he's like, you probably know that I haven't personally have not been the biggest advocate of merger either. He's like, but when this decision is made by our group, I feel that I'm obligated to go through with it and do the best that I can to make sure that our interests are represented in the new organization. And he said, there can be nothing gained from bringing that kind of an attitude into this. And he said, you know, don't you go a little bit too far when you say that, uh, we are God's children and they are the devil's children. Mm -hmm. He's like, you know, he's like, I've spent a lot of time with these people from these other groups over the years. And I've always found them to be respectful, considerate people. And, uh, he's like, certainly there is much that is wrong about these groups, but is that also not true among us? So anyway, th there was among some people, uh, a very, uh, bad attitude about it, but on the whole, uh, most of the 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 Hauge Synod people went along with this, and they tried to what they be what they referred to as serve as leaven in a larger batch of dough. Uh, they believed that their influence, their spiritual influence, was going to uh, make its mark on the new organization. Yeah, and that that uh, leaven in the in the dough is kind of the illustration you open your your uh, thesis with. I thought that was very interesting because it's used both ways. You know, both a little bit of uh, <laughs> Uh, biblically speaking, is a negative or a, or a positive. So, yeah. Well, uh, that being said, so were, were they eleven? Was it a? Were they able to change things around? Uh, could you answer this question? What have been some of the scholarly assessments of the, the coexistence uh, of the Haugian among other traditions or, or viewpoints within the Norwegian Lutheran Church of America? Well, uh, from every every bit of work that I've done over the last few years on this, um, like I said, there just really is not much. Mm -hmm. um, basically, what I have written is about the only uh, the only real attempt at analyzing it. And uh, when I went in to do my defense of my dissertation a couple of years ago, um, you know, the the readers that I had they they were so grateful that somebody bothered to do this because they're like, well, finally we have something. If mm -hmm. somebody asks a question about this, we can actually say, oh, you read this and see kind of what happened here. Um, usually the, the, the Haugians are kind of, like I said, they're kind of the butt of jokes. You mm -hmm. know, they're like, uh, yeah, you know, these people are here and they're just annoying and um, we kind of have to have to deal with them. But, you know, that no real serious um, consideration about anything positive that they've brought. So how did that uh, that Haugian group within the, that larger merged body, how did they coexist? Was there a lot of friction? Uh, do you have any examples you can share about sure. that? Yeah. Um, well, one thing that I ran into that made research into this really challenging is that after that merger of 1917, what happened on a local level is that a lot of small congregations from the three groups actually ended up merging into a single congregation. Hmm. So you have like a, you know, a Norwegian congregation, a congregation of Norwegian heritage that has predecessor congregations from really all three of them. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of hard to know for sure, like what exactly the influence was. Um, 
What I can say is that on the whole, most congregations did not maintain the Haugian practice of worship. Uh, they tended to adopt the more formal liturgical resources because that's what was taught at the seminary. Mm -hmm. And that was another piece of this too, is that leading up to the merger, uh, the Haugians wanted to make sure that a professor at the seminary would be there to teach the students about the way that the Haugians did things. Mm -hmm. um, and I have not been able to uncover any evidence that that ever really happened. Uh, it might have, hmm. but th there's no record of it. So there's supposed to be like a reserved chair on the faculty for this is the Haugian guy. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Well, and actually that part of the merger deal was that when the merger happened, at least two of the professors had to be from Haugie's Synod. Okay. So there were two of them. Uh, one of them was the guy I talked about, Gustav Marius Bruce. Uh, he taught various subjects. I think he taught New Testament as well as like practical theology. Uh, and the other guy was a guy named Mons Vey, and he taught Old Testament. So he was on the, the faculty. Um, and that leads me to the next piece here, which uh, has to do with sort of the, the friction. Uh, Gustav Marius Bruce, uh, often reported that he felt as though the other faculty members from the Norwegian Synod and the, the United Norwegian Lutheran Church, that they didn't really treat him as an equal, that mm -hmm. they didn't really take him very seriously. And uh, Mons Vey as well, uh, he felt that way, and he actually thought about leaving uh, the seminary uh, early on and going to take a congregational call somewhere in South Dakota. And when that happened, um, there was kind of an outpouring of support for him saying that um, we need you to be on the faculty uh, in order to maintain our tradition and our heritage. So in the end, he did. He stayed. But after a while, uh, when these two retired, or I think uh, Mons Ve uh, passed away uh, some years after that, and uh, Gustav Marius Bruce ended up retiring, well, then that aspect of things really wasn't represented by anybody. Um, when new faculty would be hired, they would tend to be from these other uh, backgrounds. But mm -hmm. uh, one thing that, uh, one anecdote that I can use to illustrate something about the coexistence of these traditions and how well, you know, the, the arrangement went is that Mons Vey, the professor, uh, shortly after the merger, so it would have been the year 1919, uh, Mons Vey, uh, well, one of the uh, older leaders of Norwegian Lutherans, he was pretty well respected by everybody. Uh, he was even held in high regard by the Haugians, even though he wasn't among them. Mm -hmm. uh, he died. And so there were a variety of memorial services held for him in different places. So Mons Vey was asked to participate in one of these memorial services. And when he did, they expected that he would wear the traditional clerical vestments of the, the Church of Norway, mm -hmm. uh, the white ruffled collar. And he had not worn that ever in his mm -hmm. career. And he reported to his uh, son, who went on to be a pastor as well. He said he felt really strange about it. And he was really conflicted about the rightness of that. But the power of conformity, I, I guess, is, is what you can see here. When you get a, a large merged group, naturally, anybody who's a, kind of out of a minority tradition is going to feel compelled to conform. And that's kind of what happened. Uh, a lot of congregations just kind of went along with these things. And uh, the candidates that they received as pastors, they ended up uh, coming out of the, the seminary tradition of... Uh, formality. So that's kind of what happened in a lot of ways. And so the Haugians kind of began to retreat into their own little enclaves. Mm -hmm. And one of them, uh, th there was a, a network of Haugian societies that carried on its activity. And they called themselves the Haugi Lutheran Intermission Federation. And that organization still exists today. Uh, they, they sought to perpetuate the the Haugian ethos okay. within yeah so is that is that the only uh 
self-identified Haugian group today, or are there a few others that have persisted or maybe restarted? Well, one of the things that I did uh, in my research is I looked into various organizations that involved a lot of Haugian participation at the Mm -hmm. beginning. A a lot of these independent type ministry organizations uh, that we can see today, you know, in my circles, the North American Lutheran Church, they uh, utilize a lot of these independent ministries uh, that were founded by a lot of Haugian people uh, historically. So the China Mission, uh, the China Mission was a Haugi Synod initiative originally. And today there's a group called China Service Ventures that carries on that tradition. Um, the Friends of Madagascar Mission also had a lot of Haugian influence. Interestingly, there was a, a Jewish mission uh, called the Zion Society for Israel uh, that involved a lot of Haugian influence at the beginning. Uh, today that is um, a part of a broader Christian mission to Jewish people. Uh, it's called Chosen People Ministries. Uh, another one is called the World Mission Prayer League. Uh, the World Mission Prayer League uh, uh, is an independent Lutheran mission organization based in Minneapolis. And you go to their office and they have a big portrait of Hans Nielsen Hauge uh, on their stairwell. Interesting. Interesting. And okay. So these are, you know. So they're aware of that connection too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. They, um, I wouldn't say that a lot of these organizations like, officially uh, consider themselves Haugians, but you can definitely see the historical influence on them. But that Haugie Lutheran Intermission Federation um, was very clearly founded uh, as a way of trying to perpetuate the Haugian emphasis. And I reached out to those people a few different times to see if I could get them to respond to me, and they never did. I sent them a physical letter, I sent them an email, I. Uh, I tried to contact them on Facebook and they never responded. And I just don't under, I don't understand it because usually if anybody has a sympathetic interest in your organization, you would want to reach out, but they still publish uh, their document called um, monthly uh, newsletter, whatever you want to call it called morning glory. And uh, morning glory was always kind of a thorn in the side of the leadership of the Norwegian Lutheran church of America, because they were highly critical of, you know, what the leadership was doing and they were critical of this and that. And an old professor of mine who still, well, he actually, I never had him as a professor. He's retired now, but uh, he grew up in at the tail end of some of this stuff going on. And he talked about how he had been attacked in morning glory uh, when he was a young professor, <laughs> thought it was pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I guess just to, we've spent a good quality time talking about this. Uh, last content question, kind of open open door. Is there anything else you'd like to say about the the heritage of Haugianism and the continuation of the Haugian spirit in, in North American Lutheranism? Mm-hmm. Well, I think you can see. Um, just sort of concluding remarks, I I think you can see that there are differences in emphasis. Uh, I would argue that that like the Haugie Lutheran Intermission Federation, they continue to hold their meetings. uh, And you can tell from their publications that they they reflect what I would call a little bit more of a kind of a darker kind of legalistic focus on some things. Whereas I think you can also detect Haugian influence in that more kind of positive evangelical type focus uh, in various things, you know, the the, the mission outreach organizations, the World Mission Prayer League. Um, I I think you can see that there has been over the years kind of a bifurcation in in what Haugianism really is. Uh, You get Haugians that are a little bit more, you know, positive in their outreach uh, a little bit more then you get those that are more legalistic and focused on kinds of uh you know aspects of christian living and and that sort of thing so haugianism itself you know trying to define it is a challenge uh, but it definitely um it was floating around for a very long time and um still you know the impact of it is seen today um another piece of this that i didn't mention is that Haugians were often um, 
interested in more evangelical outreach on a local level. And so a lot of Haugians in the 1920s and 1930s were active in an organization that was called the Lutheran Evangelistic Movement. Uh, the Lutheran Evangelistic Movement tried to emphasize that just because people were sitting in the pews of a congregation doesn't mean that they were truly believing Christians. Uh, they wanted people to experience their need for, you know, their, their recognition of their perdition and their, their need for redemption. Um, they didn't exactly trust the established church organization to do that work. Uh, they believed that um, people aren't necessarily going to come just with the ringing of the church bells. So they would hold these revivalistic meetings in different places. And the impact of that is still seen today. Uh, my first call as a pastor was up in northwestern Minnesota, and that area up there was heavily influenced by the Lutheran evangelistic movement. But what happened over the years is that a lot of these people who were influenced by LEM, as it was called, they eventually began to question the need for the Lutheran background mm -hmm. altogether. And so a lot of them ended up founding, founding these independent type congregations, uh, you know, non-denominational in their focus. And mm -hmm. uh, the focus is more just on like, uh, you know, personal enlightenment and, you know, personal uh, commitment, you know, the fitting well into the broader American evangelical type uh, focus that is all around us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a whole nother topic too, but that's very interesting. All right. Anything else you want to, to say? I mean, you've said a lot, you said a lot today and you say a lot more in your thesis. So I encourage anyone who's interested uh, to look at that. So, yeah, you know, I could talk about this for a long time uh, and I'm sure there are things that I'm forgetting. And I probably, when we finish here, I'll probably kick myself that I failed to mention it, but, uh, but I think uh, I, this is an important part of American Lutheran history. You know, it's not everything, but I think it's a piece that, it's worthy of recognizing as uh, something that really has influenced us. And I guess personally, I, I wouldn't, if I had lived at the time, I, I don't know that I would have been so comfortable being a part of a group like how you synod myself. Uh, but I, I have some understanding, some sympathy for what they were trying to accomplish. I, I probably would have been a, somebody who had some, a healthy respect for a lot of what they were trying to do. But even if I, I wouldn't have been so comfortable with it myself, I personally think there is value in things like church vestments and uh, liturgy and all of that. So that's mm -hmm. something that I always try to clarify when I talk to people about this. They say, well, is that your, your tradition? Is that your history? And I said, well, not really. Mm -hmm. I said, I, I understand what they're trying to do. Uh, I like some of the things that they do, but I don't, know that I'm totally on board with all of it myself. So uh, anyway, uh, that's just what I'll say about that. And uh, it's uh, it's been a wild ride researching this because it's taken me so many different places. And there was a time when I wasn't sure if I'd ever get done with that uh, dissertation, mm -hmm. but, uh, but I did. So I kept plugging away. Yeah. Well, I think we have a couple minutes left, if you don't mind, just to maybe just talk briefly about the research process. I enjoyed the the, the storyline, the narrative that we discussed today. Uh, you mentioned kind of how you got inspired to start on the topic already uh, earlier. So, do you want to tell us about your 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 research method and many any or any challenges or or surprises that that you came across during that process? Sure. Well, I did a number of things. Um, the process of gathering all the information that I needed, um, I spent about a year, you know, part time doing that because I was balancing a congregational call along with uh, three children and everything along with that. Um, the first thing that I did is I, I began to consult archives, mm -hmm. especially the archive uh, at Luther Seminary. Uh, that was really a gold mine of a lot of things. Uh, so I, I looked at especially significant personalities that I had read about connected to Haugi Synod. And um, so I, I found in their personal files a lot of uh, really interesting information that became vital for piecing this all together. Then I started looking up uh, congregational documents, you know, in the archives, finding files on the congregations themselves to see kind of how they were reacting 
to various things going on throughout the years. And uh, that also proved to be really uh, a fruitful thing. I then also uh, began digging through the records of various organizations that I've talked about, um, like that World Mission Prayer League, Mm -hmm. uh, to see kind of their their history, their, uh, you know, what the influences were on their organization. I also, what I did is I, um, I don't know if you're familiar with this at all, but there's a, leading up to the merger of 1917, there was a a two volume set published uh, by a guy named Olaf Morgan Norley. Hmm. And Olaf Morgan Norley was, um, he came out of the United Norwegian Lutheran Church tradition, uh, but he was the master statistician of Norwegian American Lutheranism. So he compiled uh, these two volumes that's a directory of every single Norwegian American Lutheran congregation in North America um, wow. that ever existed. And so I went through and I found all the congregations that were a part of Haugi Synod. And I uh, made a spreadsheet of them and I put relevant information. I reached out to many of these congregations. Um, I tried to discover the fate of all of these congregations, like what happened to them. And mm-hmm. in most cases, if you, could, you couldn't determine it without a lot of local research. But I did discover that um, out of those 342 congregations uh, that um, existed at the time of that merger, um, among those that still exist as independent congregations that hadn't merged with anything, 40% of those congregations ended up uh, joining other Lutheran groups throughout the years, other than what you would call the mainstream. Now, as you know, in time, the Norwegian tradition and all of this merged into what became the ELCA in 1988. Mm -hmm. But I was really, really interested to find out that 40% of the the surviving Haugian congregations ended up working their way into other things over Mm -hmm. the years, um, such as the Association of Free Lutheran Congregations, which was also a part of the Norwegian background, but uh, the Church of the Lutheran Brethren. Uh, there's a group called Lutheran Congregations and Mission for Christ, which is a relatively new organization. But anyway, it, it shows that that sense of friction with the uh, the mainstream, the establishment, uh, continues to exist on a local level in many places. Um, so anyway, that, that was a big part of my research too. Um, I did do some oral history interviews hmm. with, uh, some people that of the older generation that might have some living memory of this. Uh, one of those was with a man named David Preuss. Um, David Preuss was um, the president of the American Lutheran Church, the ALC, back in the nineteen um, uh, back in the nineteen seventies and into the eighties. Uh, he recently passed away, uh, but I, I talked with him back in twenty fourteen. And I asked him about his memory of uh, being a young man among, uh, you know, these pastors who came out of the Haugis Synod tradition and all this. And what he commented was, he said that you still had some of the holdouts, mm-hmm. you know, some of the, the older pastors who came out of Haugis Synod who refused to wear clerical vestments, you know, when they'd have joint services involving multiple pastors, uh, there'd be a few here and there who wouldn't wear that. But he's like, barely, uh, you you couldn't see that piece of it very much anymore. So um, anyway, so I did some of those oral history uh, interviews and that was a lot of fun too. Um, But it was a huge project. It was a mammoth uh, project. Well, as any uh, dissertation, I would expect to be. But yeah, you're you're saying how yours was a, uh, a bit larger than 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 the average one too. On, on top of it, so yeah, a lot of work it can't be can't be described. I'm sure in just a few minutes. Well, right. I think we're at a, a a good time for us to to end our interview today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jacobson, for your your time and sharing Lutheran history with us. Well, thanks. I appreciate the opportunity. Now, a few of you have asked if there are ways to support this show. What if I told you there was a way to do that and get something for yourself at the same time? At the bottom of each episode description, you will find a link to the Lutheran History Shop. There you can browse an assortment of Lutheran History gear and bling from stickers, mugs, pint glasses, water bottles, and totes. 
There are also shirts and hoodies that come in dozens of sizes and color options, so you can customize your favorite design. So whether you're looking for a figure from Lutheran history, or simply want to display your love for Lutheran history, you'll find what you're looking for at the Lutheran History Shop.